I'm guessing nine years old, my mother made a huge mistake. <laughs> sure, it's a mistake that she <laughs> later grew to regret. She paid the price for it in the years <laughs> after that. But for whatever reason, whatever motivated her, she decided that, hey, I think my kid might like a pet. <laughs> so what she did was she had a friend who in the backyard had found a garter steak. Oh, boy. She brought that garter steak to me and said, I brought you this. Hello, everyone. Jay Highland here from Project Emo again. Welcome back to our Village Voices podcast. That was Dr. Charles Chuck Smith. Dr. Smith is an associate professor of biology at Wolford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and the director of the Copperhead Institute. He and a team of fellow researchers have been studying the impact of human-created climate change through drought conditions and its impact on copperhead snakes. I first met Chuck when we were both at the University of Connecticut, and I had the absolute pleasure of an adventure with him when we were out on a reservoir in Connecticut, tracking and inspecting some of his research subjects at the time, one of my favorite denizens of the region, the Copperhead Snake. In this episode of Village Voices, we're going to not only catch up with Chuck and learn a little bit about his current work, but also explore what experiences helped create the spark of a young scientific mind and send a child off on a long journey to become a scientist. As part of our Conservation Matters episodes, we'll talk with scientists, engineers, foresters, educators, science communicators, and all sorts of folks in the village to find out just how our youth evolve into conservation-focused professionals. So hi, Chuck. It's great to connect with you again, and thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me about your work and what experiences outdoors may have helped create that drive in you to be a lifelong learner, researcher, and then want to share some of that research and, and connect it to conservation. So thank you very much for taking some time with me today. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate it. It's good to hear from you again. Yeah, it's been too long. It's been too long. We'll have to, we'll have to stay, stay in touch some more. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, you know, this kind of journey you've had, and hopefully you can share some of that with our, our villagers and our listeners to, to help them understand a little bit about what it takes to evolve a scientist. Great. I look forward to it. So, Chuck, can you share with us a bit about your background and your current research and why you've focused so much of your passion on snakes, particularly venomous copperheads? My background is kind of interesting because this is not, I mean, I wanted to work with animals. Mm -hmm. That was early on. That was something that I started with very early on, but my plan was to go in a different direction. Um, I actually in high school volunteered at a nature center oh. and got to work there every weekend with all kinds of animals, polar bears and mountain lions. And that was my direction. I was going to go into zoo work. I was going to be a zookeeper. In fact, my goal was, uh, and I'm kind of goal driven. So I kind of get uh, something I want to do and work towards that. But my goal was even early on that by the time I'm 30 years old, I'm going to be the curator of herpetology at a major zoo. Oh, that's brilliant. And yeah, and everything I did was kind of focused on that. So the first logical thing would be to uh, somehow get involved with animals. So beyond, you know, just hiking through the woods and looking for turtles. And I don't know, I had pet woodchucks and pet skunks and I had everything in the house. And <laughs> when I said my mom later regretted, you know, bringing me a garter snake, she really regretted it because the basement was full of this, these Oh, there's a menagerie down there. Excellent. Uh, so I was, that was my goal. 30 years old, volunteered at the nature center. I got a lot of great experience. And then from there, uh, I got a real position, a real zookeeper job in the reptile house at the Buffalo Zoo. And I spent four That's years great. there. And that was awesome because I got to work with really cool snakes, and crocodilians and amphibians. And, but still, I'm focused on this. But at the time of 30 years old, I'm going to be a, and then uh, from there, I, I jumped to Riverbank Zoo down here in South Carolina. So this is actually my third time to live in this state. Um, and I was a senior keeper there in the reptile house, which was another step towards that goal. Yeah. And from there, I went to the Desert Museum in Arizona. Beautiful place. Up into, it's a beautiful place in Tucson. And I was there for a number of years and closing in on my 30th birthday. And um, 
I actually interviewed for a position at a major zoo and came in number two oh. for the curator position. And um, that was like on the eve of my birthday. And the reason I did not get the position was because I did not have a college degree. Uh, yeah. So then I refocused myself and go, okay, my next goal is to get a college degree. Now I had a high school diploma. And so that meant at 30 years old, I'm going back, going back. as a freshman in college, which I did. I, I had a young child at that time. Uh, I had a full-time job at that time and I was going to become a full-time student wow. and I did that and um, it took me a few extra semesters because of sure. all those other responsibilities but I got my undergraduate degree and along the way I somehow at some point said this is really cool science is awesome <laughs> I'm really liking this Chuck went on to get his undergraduate degree at the University of South Carolina and intended to go back to working. But he followed the wisdom of an advisor and applied to and was awarded a very competitive National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. This meant his graduate education was paid for, and he ended up pursuing those studies at the University of Connecticut, where he started that research. He told me that his history working with venomous snakes led him to research the copperhead here in Connecticut. It was during this work that I initially met Chuck at UConn and saw firsthand some of the exciting research he was doing and certainly saw his passion for the species. I mean, they're, they do very interesting things. Um, and, you know, when you get to know them and you mm -hmm. get to know them by studying them, they're individuals. You don't see that. You think of snakes as being uh, these little hardwired automaton that just right. is driven by selection that do no they're individuals they actually have personalities mm -hmm. which you don't really associate with snakes but when you study them intensely when you get to really know the individuals they're different yeah they're as, they're as different as people are yep in terms of you know their personalities their temperaments they're all very different and because they're different you start to get attached to them right so yeah, this so kind that's of, how I ended up in this <laughs> this weird life that I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a just a different just a different member of the family, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do you, you know as a scientist, you try not to do that, you, right? You, this this animal has a number and it doesn't have a name, and you know it's one of my study subjects. No, I know this animal. I've known this animal for ten years. Yeah, you know. <laughs> It has a name. I'm it, sorry. It totally has a name. <laughs> we try to stay unbiased, but it's hard when you see them every single day and you watch what they do. And, you know, it's hard not to become somewhat attached to each individual. Uh, absolutely. And I think especially in terms of like, you know, conservation and conservation messaging for the broader community, the broader, you know, human society, I think in some ways that personalization is very helpful because it kind of creates the honesty of the personality of, of these animal species that, that we really need to take some protective measures for. Yeah. And when you really get to know them, when you really study them intensely, they, they do have a social structure. We don't associate mm -hmm. that with snakes and more and more data is coming out, more and more science is coming out that shows they have a social structure. They have relationships with one another. Hmm. They know one another. Um, they recognize individuals. They wow. know their relatives. Um, and so there is this sort of subtle underlying, almost secretive social interaction structure that's going on within these animals it's going on in rattlesnakes it's it's going on in in copperheads um they protect their offspring they defend their offspring really? that's historically traditionally not thought of as something that snakes are capable of but they they certainly are and it's pretty obvious when you when you really look close at them yeah that's you know when you think about what the broader concept of how we kind of as society has framed snakes and a lot of reptiles, they tend to just think of them as, you know, this is a collective group. And, and to your point earlier, just kind of like 
automatons, right? They're just, yeah. you know, it's just a Darwinian push towards survival, which of course exists, but there's so much more, there's a rich tapestry behind that that we don't necessarily ascribe to. to there species. absolutely is. There absolutely is. And so, you know, the more that you understand that, the more you come to appreciate um, the complexity of, of these animals. They are not just hardwired and you know, uh, uh, selected to like strike and defense or strike for prey. And mm. no, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot more complexity underlying what they're doing and a lot more variation between individuals. That's, that, that's apparent or that's traditionally been thought. We'll be back in a minute to hear more about Chuck and how his research led to some interesting climate findings. However, we here at Project Emo would like to take a moment and extend our gratitude to a very special partner who helped make all of this possible. Project Emo wouldn't be where it is today without the generous support of Pro Bono Partnership. Their team of experts helped us incorporate and gain charitable 501c3 status. At every step of the way, the volunteers at Pro Bono Partnership offered guidance and diligent counsel to help us grow in ways we never could have achieved on our own. Pro Bono Partnership is celebrating 25 years of providing free legal help to nonprofits in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Founded on the belief that strengthening nonprofits will make stronger communities, the partnership's mission is to provide nonprofits with the legal advice and educational resources they need to build capacity, reduce risk, and enhance programming with confidence. The partnership services were never more critical than during the last two years when the global pandemic led to shifting requirements for nonprofits and a greater need for services within communities. The partnership and its 1,400 volunteer attorneys were there to help, providing 38,000 hours of free legal assistance to nearly 900 nonprofits, valued at $19 million in 2020. Pro Bono Partnership is also a nonprofit organization, and your support is what makes their mission possible. Learn more at probonopartner.org. Back in 2019, Chuck and a team of his colleagues published an article in the prestigious journal Nature about climate change caused droughts and the impact on copperhead snakes. It sounded very much like the copperhead populations they studied were really at risk due to a fairly complex interplay of ecosystem issues. I asked Chuck to shed some insight into that. This was an artifact, it's sort of a benefit of actually studying these animals long term. We have been studying them, and by these animals, I mean the same population. So mm -hmm. we know these animals intimately uh, for close to 20 years. And we collect data on reproduction and diet and movement and blood samples for mm -hmm. genetics, genomics. And we noticed that. Oh, reproduction is varying over years. By that, I mean some years we would find a lot of reproductive pregnant females. Okay. I mean, they're everywhere. And then other years we would struggle to find just a single one. Wow. And we wondered if this has something to do with changing environmental conditions. So we went and looked at climate data. And Connecticut had experienced pretty severe, pretty prolonged drought. And when you line the climate data up with the reproductive data, wow. it lines up perfectly. Wow. And that in years with normal or excessive rain, typically the following year, there's a lot of reproduction. And in years that are very dry, or extremely dry, reproduction in these animals fails. And by that, I mean, you don't find a lot of reproductive females. Any given year, we're guessing on average half the females are reprodu reproducing, half of the females okay. are pregnant. But there's a clear trend that during wet periods, there's a lot of reproduction. During very dry periods, there's very little reproduction. And so what's happening is as that drought continues on, fewer and fewer females are reproducing. And then you have to wonder, and, and at the very end, at the, at the extremist of the drought, there are no reproductive females. Wow. As far as we tell, nobody's reproducing. So you have to wonder, like, wh what's the connection between reproduction and climate, like rainfall? And it seems to be, and the most logical explanation is 
food resources. Hmm. These guys feed on amphibians, they feed on small mammals, and the success of those food animals depends wow. on water. Sure. So in dry years, you don't have a lot of amphibian reproduction, you don't have food for the snakes, and that means the following year, they don't have the energy, the resources to devote to reproduction, so they don't reproduce. Wow. What we found interesting, and this is sort of the, the take home message of that study, was that when you think about effects of climate change, you tend to think that they're going to be gradual and accumulating and slow over time. You don't think that it's going to be immediate. Mm-hmm. But clearly, you know, over a relatively short period of time, just a few years of drying, the results are dramatic and uh, immediate. And during those dry periods, reproduction stops. The other interesting thing is, do those effects uh, continue on once that drought has subsided? Okay. And you might think that, yeah, we have zero reproduction in this year, and those effects are going to linger for a long time. And it turns out that when the drought ended, when the drought broke and started to rain again, the response of the animals, the rebound of the animals, was almost immediate. The following year, the amphibians ramped up. There were a, a lot of food. And the year after that, reproduction returned to wow. pre-drought levels. So... The effects can be rapid, dramatic, and immediate. Now, had that drought went on even longer, I think we go beyond they're going to lose reproduction, and I think we're going to start to see or would start to see increases in mortality because now the food's not just necessary for reproduction. The food resources are necessary just to maintain the population. So I think at a population level, an even longer drought would start to have some serious impacts on the viability of the population. Wow. I mean, there's just so, such a complex interplay going on there of, of all of the animals in that ecological system that, you know, we see that it sounds like you saw that they bounce back a bit, but that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that, that they're going to sustain long term if there's this really extreme change in their their environment. Oh, sure. And I think the first thing to go is the first thing we saw go, which is reproduction. Okay. Right. That's the first the first sort of evidence or the first life history trait that's going to suffer is reproduction. And then after that, if it continues on, then you're going to start to see increases in mortality where animals simply don't have the resources not only to reproduce, but just to survive. Sure. And if they don't, if the population itself is not large enough to sustain environmental adversity, right. then we, we really see some population risk for an entire species. Right. And then the population we study is already, um, I wouldn't say necessarily at risk, mm-hmm. but there are stressors there. It is bounded by interstate highways. It is in a public sure. area. Um, it is used for recreation. And so there's already limits to that population. You can't right. have animals coming in from outside the population, migrating in because they're yeah. bounded by interstates. So you have that already existing. It's a limited population. And then you add on top of it yeah. changes in the environment. And then you've now layered on another stressor on top of that. And so you know, there are limits to how many stressors you can subject the population to before it starts to suffer. Do you work in the conservation world and have stories to share? Was that a yes? I couldn't hear you. Maybe that's not how these podcast things work. Well, if you said yes, we'd like to hear from you. As part of an ongoing discussion within the Project Emo Village, we'd like to hear the conservation stories of industry pros near and far for Conservation Matters episodes. We'd like to learn from you and hear tremendous tales of thrilling heroics. Stop by our website or email us at villagevoices at projectimo.org. That's projectimo.org. For all of the villagers following along out there, Take a moment and think about a spark of passion you had as a child. What was that moment like? Did it create a ripple effect of emotion and drive that still carries with you today? 
Well, with the amount of passion and longevity that he obviously brings to his research, one can imagine that a younger Chuck Smith must have spent some time in the woods exploring, turning over rocks, digging around in the mud and the like. I asked him to help me understand what created that spark for him. Oh, I can go back in my old photographs and there is one and I it's stamped with a date because it's an old Polaroid. It was 1968, which wow. would put me at eight years old, which also give away my age. <laughs> but I'm holding a painted turtle in my driveway and my mother took that photograph. And I know by that time, I was already into animals. Yeah. So it started very early. I had a golden guide, you know, those small little field guides. Yes. And I had that memorized and I would stare at the photos. And, yeah. and that was probably, oh God, seven years old, six years old. This was back in the day. Things have changed, obviously. Sure. Where an eight year old could wander off yeah. from home and go up over the hill to the little swampy pond over the top of the hill by the factory yeah and spend the day there just by themselves wandering around through you know the muck and the rocks and the logs and and uh it was not a concern and that's what i would do i would disappear for hours on end yeah. and you know my, my parents knew where i was i was up at the swamp right. and looking at bullfrogs looking you know, like, you know it doesn't matter what it could be a plant. I was fascinated sure. with cat and nine tails, you know, I was yes. just fascinated with those things. Yep. And it didn't matter if it was outdoors. I was hooked on it. Yeah. It's amazing how a children's nature guide and a heaping pile of curiosity leads to adventures in the woods. Shouldering a pack and taking to a trail in a swamp nearby, small hands clasping walking sticks and binoculars, coming back home covered in dirt and grass stains. Probably in need of a band-aid, but too hungry and excited to care. As time goes on, though, how often do our teenage years leave that behind? The pressures of school and being cool, more focused on our social life than wildlife. All too often, things retreat from the woods, not Chuck Smith. And then, in the later teenage years, and I had my neighborhood friends, and we would do neighborhood friend things, yeah. but they were into muscle cars. When gotcha. everybody got their driver's license, they were... That, that was the thing, right? The muscle cars. And <laughs> right. That was not my thing. No. I had, when I got my first car, I had a beat up old Ford Mustang with three different colors on it because it was all pieced together. <laughs> um, because I didn't want to invest my time or yeah. what little money I had in my car. I want to invest it in like being out there and yeah. finding mistakes. I remember at one point, a friend, sort of a friend of mine, goes, <laughs> what are you going to do for work? You gonna, is this what you're going to do? Is this like, you can't make a living doing this. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And then I volunteered at the nature center and volunteer doesn't get paid. And here we go. Like, you're not getting paid for this. Like, right. I'm like, this is not what it's about for me. It's not about making money. It's about doing what I love to do. And this is what I love to do. And, um, I don't know what ever became of that friend. <laughs> so, but, um, no, this is sort of where I ended up. Yeah. It was a path that I ran down and was still out there doing basically the same thing. It's just turning over rocks and looking under logs and just finding animals. And it, it yeah, if it's a snake, that's awesome. If it's a, a bald eagle flying over, it's like, oh my God, yeah. it's a bald eagle. Bald eagle. <laughs> you still get that same charge. Um, but yeah, it goes back a long, long way. Despite all the pressures of teen life, those years do present some unique opportunities. As we grow and mature, so do our chances to really immerse ourselves in an understanding of the natural world and gain some pretty critical life experiences as we're given more and more responsibility. Encouraging adolescents along these paths of discovery can make a huge difference. The nature center, working in that nature center as a teenager, yeah. what was what really kind of connected you to that? specifically rather than just stomping out in the woods and kind of exploring what kind of really drew you into the nature center as a place to oh, spend time so it was a nature center but it had some really cool animals um <laughs> and i think it still exists it's in worcester, worcester oh, okay. Mass. um they had polar bears they had mountain lions they had wow. bobcats 
They even had some venomous snakes, although the volunteers weren't even allowed in the room with the snakes. But <laughs> um, they had a big reticulated python. They had an American alligator. So I had the opportunity to help care for some what I thought were really cool animals. I mean, where, where else am I going to get to feed a polar bear or right. hose out a polar bear enclosure? Wow. So that to me was amazing. Here I am, you know, I'm catching a bullfrog, I'm catching a snapping turtle, and I get to work with mountain lions and wolves. That's amazing. So it was, yeah, it was, it was a really good training in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, working with somewhat exotic animals, but just getting exposed to all kinds of different animals. We had elephant shrews. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but yeah. they're at the nature center. And they were the most amazing little animal, little snorkel-like nose. And I would just sit there and like watch them for hours. But this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Once we had a chance to look at his current work and reflect upon what childhood events helped to propel Chuck into the field of biology, we spent some time exploring the larger concept of conservation. I wanted to know how the study of biological sciences informed conservation efforts. As it turns out, knowing biology and how organisms interact within an ecosystem is absolutely critical to protecting our natural world. Well, if you're going to conserve something, you need to understand what it is you are conserving, and you need to understand what outcome you desire mm -hmm. in terms of what would it mean for a species to be conserved, right? And mm -hmm. so you need to understand that you, you're not just conserving the species that you're interested in. Okay. Because what you're conserving is more than just the animal itself in its life history, because it is not a standalone entity. It okay. doesn't exist in isolation or a vacuum. It exists at the intersection of a whole bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. It exists with its habitat. It exists with the other species that coexist in that same area. Mm -hmm. um, it exists in the context of the environment, the climate where it, where it, exi where it lives. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand the intersection of all those, the interplay of all those different things, and then determine, is it all important or is just a little bit of it important? Okay. Now that's, that's really abstract, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're, for instance, talking about a, a, a species of say montane rattlesnake that lives at high elevation, okay. right? You're, you're not just conserving that rattlesnake, you're also conserving the habitat itself, the area. Sure. And so when you're gonna conserve the area, you need to know how much area I need to set aside and what sort of players in that habitat are necessary um, for the sustaining that, say, montane rattlesnake. Okay. To do that, to understand all those intersections everything that's intertwined yeah that's where the biology comes in sure right that's where um sure you're studying the animal you're interested in mm -hmm. but you also need to know the plants you need to know the insects yeah. you need to know the species it feeds on the species that feed on it sure you need to know the annual or long-term cycles in the in the climate the hydrology all of it it's so it's 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 you're not just conserving the species what well, you could be but in order right. to do it properly you need to think about holistically the Much whole better. thing and then the question is how much of the whole thing do we need and of course the more the better sure right and but the only way to know how much of the whole thing you need is to use biology to understand what is in that whole thing Chuck then helped me dive a bit more deeply into the concept of conservation. We turned back to the snake populations he studied in Connecticut and explored the nuances we need to understand about a given animal species to make impactful conservation steps. And then we talked about a broader conservation concept. What value do societies place upon our wild cousins? I mean, it could be something as simple as um, 
with our rattlesnake species that we want to conserve, you know, there, you know this in New England, right? They're a high vernacular. There are mm-hmm. places that all the animals come to in the winter, the overwinter. If you don't understand that and you just set aside, say, a summer foraging range right. and you don't pay attention to high vernaculum and you don't conserve that, then you're pretty right. much doomed the population because sure. that is an essential factor that's absolutely necessary for the long-term existence of that population. Um, can they, so suppose it's not possible to conserve that, that then, is it possible then to, uh, produce an artificial then would snakes or uh, rattlesnakes use that? Okay. Is it, can they actually shift to a different site? Is that even possible? Um, The only way to answer those questions is through biology, through studying the biology of these animals. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, an example of one essential, absolutely essential component for the existence or the long-term existence of a species. Um, yeah, there are plenty of questions we know nothing about. Would they use artificial hibernaculum? Can they move from one hibernaculum to another if the one is not available? Don't know the answers to that, but, you know, the viability of, that species in that greatly area dependent. greatly depends on something like that. So, you know, we've focused a lot about, obviously, your passion is in, it with snakes, copperheads, and we've just talked a little bit about um, about rattlesnakes, and it, I also have an affinity towards to snakes as well. And so snakes, right? It's uh, it's safe to say that both you and I have this affinity to, our, to those cousins of ours, but that's not necessarily something shared by everybody because, you know, they – Let's be honest, they may not be the cuddliest members of our natural world, right? Um, right? It's easy to look at a kit fox in a photograph and be like, oh, that's just adorable. Not as easy for many people with, with, with a snake. So can you help us understand the role that snakes, like copperheads, play in their ecosystems and, and how critical they are to that? Sure. I mean, part of it, that's a two-part answer to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first part is the obvious answer, you know, the, the economic kind of reason why snakes are important because they control rodent populations sure. and without them and they, they consume so many rodents a year and we'd be overrun with rats and, sure. and you know, and that, that's an obvious answer, sure. right? Loss to crops because of rodent infestation mm-hmm. that could be controlled by snakes, but the snakes aren't there. So now we have to use other means to control rodents. The other answer is not to me, not the economical. It's the intrinsic answer. It's the intrinsic value that we associate with organisms. And that's harder to grasp. That's harder to sell. Yeah. Right? When you put a dollar amount on the value of something, Mm -hmm. that's relatable. Sure. When you put a value onto something exclusive of any economic benefit, that's not relatable. But I would argue that everything has an intrinsic value in just its existence that there's value for instance let me give you an example unrelated to snakes sure so gorillas Mm -hmm. right we could say that gorillas have some sort of economic value thus to us there is a benefit in conserving gorilla populations i would argue that that to me the sheer fact that gorillas exist, although I may never, I hope to, but I may never see a gorilla in the wild sure. ever. There is value in knowing that out there at yeah. this very moment, there are wild gorillas. Yes. Now, I cannot put a dollar amount on that value to me, but to me, that is valuable in knowing that. And I right. can say that with you name it, any species. Yeah. To me, there is value in knowing that somewhere right now and i don't know what the weather is like in connecticut but it's mm-hmm. entirely possible if it's warm that there is a copperhead at my field site in connecticut basking yeah. in the sunshine oh, that'd be and there's <laughs> there's a great value to me in knowing that just the knowledge of that huh. so um yeah in terms of conservation the way to sort of traditionally to get action mm-hmm. <laughs> is to associate a dollar benefit sure um but 
but I think, but I think if you can show people that there is a benefit in just something existing, because dollar you know, dollar benefits change. Right. It's valuable one day, may not be valuable another day. But that value is still there if it's an intrinsic value. Now the question is, yeah. how do you get people to buy into that? Yeah. How do you and how I think how you get people to buy into it ideally would be, you know, if I could lead tours to the field site in Connecticut and show people the animals sure. doing what they do in their natural habitat, but that's not practical. Right. So maybe the other value is letting people get a glimpse inside the lives of these animals, yeah. be it perhaps like through a podcast describing you know, the things you don't expect these animals or any animal to do that's surprising, that's relatable. Sure. Or, um, you know, any way, educational programs, any way that can expose people to uh, the complexity, intricacies, uh, the, the things we share with whatever animal it is, it sort of almost tugs at their heartstrings. Yeah, <laughs> you know? absolutely. That they can connect with. Absolutely. Uh, so that's my, that's my long answer to a short question. So it seems that to engage in conservation efforts, there's a critical need to help society develop an intrinsic value to animal species. Snake people like Chuck and I can sometimes have an uphill battle sharing that affinity. What works? Branding. It's all about branding. You know, maybe we're making a little progress and that some people will start to think that these animals are, are kind of cool, right? And the first reaction's not like, you know, that'd make a good hat band, which is often right. a comment that you see. Yes. But yeah, you're right. The fact is that there's plenty of research out there now that shows there are social relationships within populations of snakes. They, they know each other. They That's recognize amazing. each other. Um, moms will protect their, their kids. And we've actually made the change uh, to, you know, not calling them uh, snakelets or right. little copperhead. We call them pups. Pups. There's moms and pups, and that's, that's intentional. Awesome. Yeah. That's intentional because, you know, we call other animal offspring pups. Sure. They're furry, but it's right. the same scenario. It's yeah. a mother and their offspring, so we yep. call them pups. Pups is more relatable. Sure. Uh, and, you know, perhaps changing just the terminology might help to change people's attitudes because, in fact, yes, moms do protect their pups, and moms will protect the pups of other moms. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, if they're related, yeah, sure. That is absolutely brilliant. So, Chuck, it sounds like there's quite a bit of work and passion that goes into a career as a biologist, researcher, and an educator. Um, but it also sounds like there's a very large need for people to carry forward with that work, especially given some of the, the dynamics that we're facing globally with climate change and, and habitat loss. Um, if you could, would you share some wisdom and advice for young conservationists and naturalists out there? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think my first bit of advice slash counseling would be to realize that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. um, again, I grew up uh, with friends who were into muscle cars, yet I'm this weirdo <laughs> out there who just love animals and being outside. Yep. And it, the tendency is to feel like, Am I the only one out here? Is this, am, I, am I the one weird one that I'd rather do this than mess with car engines? Yeah. Uh, you're not the only one out there. Yep. There are plenty of other people, um, young people, who are equally passionate about this stuff. And the challenge is to connect with them, to find them. Now, back in the day, we didn't have social media. Now we do, so it's a lot easier sure. uh, to find people who are like-minded, who are passionate about the same thing. So find those people, connect with those people, um, share your passion with those people, mm -hmm. and then find other people, mentors, for instance, who have that passion as well. You can find them at uh, nature centers, zoos, universities. I know um, when somebody comes to me and just wants to talk about animals or snakes mm -hmm. or research opportunity, even young, junior high school, you know, or younger, yeah. I welcome All that in. person in, yeah. you know. 
it's a kindred spirit to me. Yes. Um, that's me many, many years ago. So there are people out there and there are plenty of them who want to help you, who share those same interests, who share those same passions, who want to make a difference and want to help you make a difference. So find the people, connect with yeah. the people, seek out opportunities to, to get more experience, mm -hmm. to be mentored by people that have been doing this for a number of years. That would be uh, my number one bit of advice. Sure. My number two bit of advice would be, um, unlike the path I took, focus on your education. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be important. Yeah. I remember being a youngster going, I don't need Spanish. I don't need French. Math, yeah. what? I don't need that either. I just need to be outside. Right. Well, later on, I need to catch up. Yeah. And if I could go back and change things, I probably would have done it in a logical order. Which right. Is, you know, education onward i did yeah. the onward part then the education <laughs> and then the onward part again so right. sure it may not seem important now and things you're studying uh may seem sort of arbitrary and not really relevant or necessary but they will be yes <laughs> math i wish i took back in my you know <laughs> early education that i really didn't focus on boy i wish i had it later on yeah so find like-minded people connect with like-minded people Find yourself some mentors and focus on your education. Yeah. Um, because it's a lot easier to do it when you're young than to do it like yeah. I did. You just go back and redo it when you're older. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, about you, how can our listeners learn more about you and your research? Um, probably the easiest is just go to Google. It would be <laughs> Google, you know, it. Google Scholar. And um, you can just type in my name research will come up awesome. uh, you can find me on uh, my Wofford page okay. um, have, I'm at Wofford College mm -hmm. in Spartanburg South Carolina and so uh, you can find me there or uh, Facebook yeah. <laughs> follow me on Facebook I don't have I don't have <laughs> Twitter I don't have Instagram <laughs> yeah, I right. do but I don't use any of it but right. um, just you know Charles Smith at UConn and if you search for that yep. you'll you'll find me on on Facebook alone I'm as of late, I'm rarely on there because there's just right. so many other things to do. Right. Yeah, there's, there's, there's snakes to go research. Yeah. There's other, well, it's getting to be winter, so we're winding down, winter but there's stuff. still tons of things to do. Yes. That's awesome. Chuck, it, it was simply excellent to catch up with you after all these years. Um, I still think back fondly to that time that we were out there collecting Copperhead subjects many, many moons ago. And it was just an absolute blast and to participate in, in that. Yeah, I, I remember that day, and I remember, I remember <laughs> specifically uh, one of the places we were. It was, yeah. it, it just a beautiful the, the well, Yeah, it's a great site, and yeah. that I, I remember the we were we were tagging animals, and yeah. that one cliffside where yep. the pregnant females hang out. It was a wonderful day. I can think back to that night. all the time, and I'm like, I keep meaning I just need to go back and just take a hike there, and maybe next summer when. Uh, when, when we're likely to see some out there again, I might, I might just head back out and take a walk. And well, yeah, and if you do, I'll, I'll, I'm planning on going back up there. Oh. You know, we've, we've microchipped the animals, so microchips don't have batteries. That's awesome. Just like in your dog. So if yep. there are any animals still there um, that have microchips, we will know it. And we can go back and look in their history and go, ah, the animals, we we've been following that animal since 2003. That is so, brilliant. Yeah. So that's one of my goals is to get back up there and, and see who's still around, kind of reconnect with the old gang. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, and you are yeah. always welcome back up here. And again, thank you so much for sharing with us today your time, your experiences, and, and your stories and, and your passion for the for the research. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate I it. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Yes, likewise. That's it for this episode, villagers. Thank each of you for tuning in and sharing your time with the village today as we heard from our friend Dr. Chuck Smith about the importance of the youthful spark and its power to create the passion for science. If you like this episode, subscribe. If you really like this episode, share it out and head on over to our website at projectemo.org to learn more about our charitable efforts to create conservation stewards through adventure and nature education. Each of our episodes and all of our efforts at Project Emo are supported by the generosity of listeners just like you you.